Well, when I got home after the last class, I was this current geographic waiting for me, and the entire issue was devoting to trying to save the world while there's a little time left. And they're not kidding. <laughs> so there is the statistical. We're not going to linger on it. We have to get to Mosiah's speech, which is on the same subject. The point is this, for example. At the current rate of destruction, what do we have the millions here? Yes. Current rate of destruction, our tropical forests will be well, who will be gone within 25 years. By the time most of you are not anywhere near my age, they'll be gone, and with them, at least a million species, probably many more, of which only a relative handful have been tested for possible use by man. And here's a very interesting statistic with regard to our book of Mosiah for today, when he talks about if a, servant, uh, if a person puts up his petition, and you refuse to give him something to eat, what happens to you? You have grave need of repentance. And you say, well, I have earned mine, and so forth. He says, you never, never in the Book of Mormon there's such a thing as the worthy needy. A person is a needy, he's a need, and that's that. Whether he's worthy or not has absolutely nothing to do with it. So it says here, a quarter of the Earth's people, 80% of its, re control 80% of its resources. Then he says, this is skipped down this, and unbelievably, and this is unbelievable, unbelievably in this golden age of science, 40,000 young children die of hunger and related diseases, diseases related to hunger, every day. That was hit me. I thought it'd be perhaps every year or something like that, but every day. You think that'd take care of the population problem, but of course it wouldn't. And so it goes on. Well, I'm going to, to harrow your souls up with these, with these statistics and so forth. This is the way they do it, too. Hmm. This year, 14 unarmed members of the Tucana tribe were massacred by killers in the hire of timber dealers so they could take over the lands, and this happens everywhere. The, uh, there are organizations to kill Indians and get their lands. Whole villages have been wiped out or pushed around and killed by thugs from the town of Pijamara in order to consolidate the land for one big rancher. This is this imbalance in which Mosiah has a great deal to say about him, how relevant it is today. Well, we can't go into this, get hold of this last uh, geographic, and it'll scare the daylights out of you. So there's room to be for fear and trembling with your generation. I'll be out of it by then. <laughs> no, I won't. You'd be surprised how many connections we've got with the other side. Well, let me read you the closing lines of the... Uh, <laughs> Well, if I lived as long as any of my grandparents, I'll be around still, an old pest. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is the way the book of Mo Moses closes, and it's the way in the 6th chapter 11 verse of Genesis, it's even stronger there. This is what happened to the world then. Hayeth kamale hamas. And God saw that all flesh had become corrupted before him. And he says, I'm going to destroy all flesh from off the earth, for the earth is filled with violence. And then the Old Testament says, for they have filled the earth with violence. Therefore, I am going to destroy all flesh from off the earth. Now, we've reached that stage again. Oh, this is another, another important thing mentioned here. Remember, in the past, this is a thing that we bring out in the Pearl of Price class, of course, in the Book of Moses. The five great periods called the periods of mass extermination, when almost all, there have been five times in history, uh, explained by meteorites, this sort of thing, when almost all species were wiped out and new species arose all of a sudden. We won't go into that, that's a long story. But we're in another one of those times, and the man tells us here that, uh, now notice, the last days of Eden. Last days, it's, it's, it's the doomsday book we have here, you see. Virtually all students, and this is Professor Wilson at Harvard, he says, virtually all students of extinction process agree that the biological diversity is in the midst of the sixth great crisis, this time precipitated entirely by man. There have been these crises of mass extermination, and this one is going to be as thorough as any, and we're to blame for it. So the scriptures are not uh, talking about something that's fantastic and beyond this, though we used to think so. I mean, when I was younger, I mean, uh, this sounded so far out, we didn't take it very seriously. So we're on the third Mosiah's great speech. Notice he's going to, he's going to uh, three parts. This speech has the first part. Notice they're, they're celebrating and so forth. And he's telling them that the good times they've been having are just a prelude to great things to follow and to eternal life, when they can have joy and salvation forever. 
figure, if they do the right thing. So the second part is don't let it go to your head. Notice how he cuts them down in that second part. You're nothing, you're less than nothing, you're the dust, you poor miserable creatures and so forth. What a way to be talking to the people on a great national celebration. And then the third part is devoted entirely to economics. What do you mean if it goes to your heads? Then you'll get this idea of inequality, then it will greed and he says it will destroy you here and it will damn you forever. Again, I might recall you to a current publication. You, have you seen the new time? Spread on the cover of the new issue of time is just one word, greed. And that's describing our American civilization. So don't think Mosiah is not relevant to the times we live in. I don't think it's not a prophetic book. And I doubt if Joseph Smith would have been able at the age of 23, being just a bit of poor, uneducated farmer, to have figured this all out. Uh, so we're on the ninth verse of the third chapter of Mosiah. He cometh unto his own. That is how it happens. He cometh unto his own, and he tells us, for example, in the, in the 13th verse, who his own are, for example. The Lord hath sent his holy prophets among all the children of men. His own will carry on the work for him when he isn't there, you see. He comes to his own with that purpose, that salvation through them, you see, that salvation might come to the children of men who have faith on his name. They will carry abroad the name and the doctrine, see. They will they will perpetuate and spread, of course, the name, because he's not there anymore. You have his name to call upon. So he comes to his chosen people, and he trusts them to carry on the name. Uh, and uh, to the rest of the human race. A marvelous uh, seventh chapter of, uh, of Alma on that. And uh, the rest of the children of men, even as through faith on his name, and they shall come, but He'll be turned down cold. Remember the beginning of John, everywhere the, the light shined in darkness, and darkness comprehended not. He came to his own, and his own received not. But they won't receive him. But that very important addition, just a few did. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave power to become sons of God. See, what a prize, you see. It's worth it, going through all that. But he's, not, he's going to be refused by the world and by his own people, as we all know from the New Testament, of course. They shall consider him a man, and say he hath a devil, and shall scourge him, and shall crucify him. Well, then, and behold, also, his blood atoneth, well, but if those who, are, those who aren't guilty, who've never heard the gospel, his blood atones for their sins, they won't be damned forever, because that they've been taken care of. But, 12th verse, but woe unto him who knows and rebels. That's a different story entirely. Except it be through, ah, but the door is open to him to except it be through repentance. That's why he keeps hammering away at repentance here. And <laughs> make sure it's safe. Except it be through repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here are his own, the holy prophets among all, to every kindred, nation, and tongue, believe that, and this is the first step. See, this is what they must do in the 13th verse here. First, they believe that Christ would come. The same might receive remission of their sins and rejoice with exceeding great joy, as though he had already come among them. Don't worry what dispensation you live in. You're going to have the same trials and you have just the same privileges that any other dispensation has. The strongest test in the Book of Mormon as to whether people will have faith on the mission of Jesus Christ is what? Well, he hasn't come yet. We don't notice we're going to have people like, well, Sherem and so forth, and Korhar and the rest. They say, you know, he hasn't come yet. We don't believe there is such a thing. We're supposed to look forward to something we haven't seen. He won't even come here, they say. Well, then after he had come, what happens? Well, in the 1940s, the big thing, and since then, in, in theology of all the Christian churches, all the journals led by such people as Rudolf Bultmann and so forth, the great Lutheran pastor, was, Oh, well, and Albert Schweitzer the, uh, was to demythologize, de-eschatologize Jesus. See, anything that's supernatural in his story, the story about being the son of God and that, that's a myth. So you demythologize it. You move that out of the New Testament, and then you have the real story of Jesus, the good teacher, the kind man, and that was it, it's as far as you have. So he's just as hard to accept after his coming. Though he did come and we have the record. No, we take the record then, a very good record, especially John's record. John, remember, is the only New Testament figure mentioned in the Book of Mormon. John's figure, and they demythologize it. They take the whole message out. But what about the hardest time of all was when he was actually there. That's the hardest time they had to believe. They wouldn't believe him then because they could see he was just a man, you see. And uh, he says, they say, Abraham we know, and Moses we know, he's our prophet, but who is this guy, they say, they use that word here. And they wouldn't accept him at all. So it, it's an equal trial for any dispensation. If he hasn't come yet, are you going to believe? If he has already gone long ago, 2,000 years ago, who can go for that old mythology? No, uh, that's a test too. Or when he was actually there, that's the hardest of all. Look, you can see he's a man, that's all there's to it. And he was crucified and the rest. Well, and then, 
But, he says, the Lord God saw that his people were a stiff-necked people. He knew that they would refuse them. Notice the 14th verse here. And he appointed to them a law, even the law of Moses. That was for their weakness. It was catered to their weakness, of course, as much as the law as you can take. But they didn't understand that the law of Moses availeth nothing except through the atonement of blood. It has to be completed. You have to have the original. They thought just by keeping the law, they would be, would be saved. And now he talks a lot about the little children. Why the emphasis on little children? Because the little children are the only segment of society that offer no resistance to the message. They qualify, and they offer no resistance because they're not guilt-ridden, because they don't feel guilty and they're not afraid to accept as little children. They're not even so forth. But the reason you accept, the reason we shy off, the reason I don't want to go for all this is I have this subconscious burden of guilt. I've been doing wrong things. I'm not up to it. That's why whenever the angel appears, everybody is scared stiff. And the angel must stay. Don't be afraid. I, God's good message and so forth. Uh, because it's that culture shock. We don't want to be exposed to another world, uh, to what we might be and so forth. It's too much to take. It's terrifying, utterly terrifying. You'd, you'd, go, you'd sooner go crazy than people do rather than that, you see, rather than avoid it. Even little children. Or, or, as in Adam, by nature they fall, even so the blood of Christ atones for their sins, he says. And uh, he judgeth, and his judgment is just, but men drink damnation to their own souls, except, notice I'm talking about the 18th verse, oh, we skipped a, a very important verse, 17th. There is no other way, or no other means, there's no other device. Can you think of any other way? No other device. We follow this pattern because it was the pattern that was laid down in the eternities, in the council in heaven, and so forth. Through the name of Christ, the Lord omnipotent. Behold, he judges, and his judgment is just, men are not. But men drink damnation to their own souls. Don't try to do it yourself. Uh, just like uh, do-it-yourself brain surgery or something like that, trying to save yourself. Well, the reason is this, you see, the, uh, that we can't, uh, well, you might atone for your sins in this life of things you do, you see. You might make up for them and so forth. But we're talking about eternal life of going on forever. There's nothing you can do to, to equip yourself for that, to, to qualify yourself for that by removing all your sins and so forth. He's going to talk about men being uh, uh, carnal, sensual, and devilish. We have to get along here anyway. See, and it's only through the atoning, atoning blood of Christ, the Lord God omnipotent. For the natural man, here it is, the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam. You shy off. You won't have anything to do unless he yields to the enticings of the spirit. The thing is this. See, you have blown it now. There's only one thing you can do. Put yourself entirely into my hands and it will all be taken care of. But you have to do something by putting yourself into my hands. The Lord says that doesn't mean you just lie down and don't do anything. That's which is the by grace you are saved. I've heard that a million times. Of course, nur gnade, only grace. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm reborn and that's all there is to it and so forth. No. Uh, it's as if you'd taken off in a small plane in the airport. You got in, you've never flown in your life. You turn the key and you're suddenly in the air. What do you do? The tower says, all right, put yourself in my hands. Do exactly as I tell you and I can get you landed. But don't try to do anything. Try to fix it yourself. Do as I tell you. Then why should I do that? <laughs> think about that? You refuse to do it. But that's the only thing you can do. And here we're in that, uh, in that condition. We must follow instructions implicitly. When he says, put yourself in my hands, you say, well, I just lie down and let him land me. Oh, no, we don't have automatic pilot. You've got to land it. But you do what I tell you to do, you see. And that's the position we're in. You have to do something. But we can't help ourselves. See, either you help yourselves and do it all, or somebody else does it all. That's what the Christian world, uh, at Christmas, right here, uh, the thing is that all the human race was lost. Christ came, and we sing the song, and everybody is saved, and that's that. Men are saved from their sins. And he's taken away the sins of the world, so we have nothing to worry about. That was the glad news. Well, it wasn't the glad news. The glad news is the Lord has shown you a way out. And that's what it is here, and of course, that's what we have there. The, uh, so an awful view of their own guilt. Oh, well, here, here. This is what we're talking about. Skip across the page here. And let's say, yeah, so that's the enticing. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. It's enticing, doing everything you can to bring you into his orbit. And so he wants you to cooperate and do something for yourself, and he'll tell you what to do. But you have to put off the natural man. That's what I say. Uh, you have to be able to put yourself entirely into his hands. Don't try to, to do the thing yourself. And become as a child. Why the emphasis on children here? As I say, children will accept the gospel, will accept the plan, and will obey and uh, offer no resistance. 
And the gospel shall spread through every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Again, the universality of the Book of Mormon. And when all have had the chance, then, behold, none shall be found blameless. When they've all had the chance in the 20th verse, then none shall be blameless except the little children, of course. And the others can save themselves only through repentance and faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Why the name? Because he's all we have. The name is, I mean, the account of him, he's the story, the name, what you refer to. You have no identity without your name. I have to know who you're talking about, you say. Uh, let's, uh, let's worship so-and-so. Well, give me his name. I don't know who to worship unless you tell me who I'm worshiping and so forth. And then he says these words, the 23 shall stand as a bright testimony against this people. Wherefore, they shall be judged every man according to his works. That's good, you see, according to his works, not whether, whether you believe or not, or, or, uh, but what you do, or your intentions, or you see the uh, people were burned at the stake for believing the wrong things, not for anything they did that was bad, but for believing, that was the standard thing. But they should be judged every man according to his, and it's in the singular notice, every man according to his work. You don't be judged with the society, uh, you're not uh, judged by your associates or anything like that. It's what you do is what you'll be judged by, no matter what society you're in, whether you live in, well, that's Solzhenitsyn's great book on the Gulag Archipelago. We used to read it, they don't read it anymore, it's too big and too hard to read, I suppose. Uh, but uh, the point is this, that in this prison, the worst possible prison, where nobody has any freedom of all, everybody was just as free as air, because you could do and think what you wanted to regardless. Nobody can stop you from doing that. And it was, so the idea, you'll be judged by your works and your words, you're going to tell us later on. But then what will happen? Of course, as I say, if you see the angel, what do you do? You shrink from the presence of the Lord. Anything is better to that. Into a state of misery, you draw back deliberately into a state of misery, which is safer and endless torment whence they can no more return, therefore they have drunk damnation to their souls in here for. Is that bad? Well, the alternative. Uh, the, as I say, as we mentioned the last time, that you'll never be able to cure yourself of it. Uh, the serious mistake of regret is permanent, you see. For example, you make a mistake in solving an equation or a problem. If you go on with the problem, the further you go, you don't wipe that out. That doesn't mean it gets worse and worse and does more mischief as far as you go. You, you can never get away from it, you see, and you never get away from this. You can cover it over and so forth. When it talks about this eternal wisdom, because it's your torment of mind that you're in, to say. The more we see the folly and loss of what we did back in time, is what, you regret you did something, uh, it's, not, it's not wiped out with time. You say, it could have been so, if I hadn't, if I only hadn't done that, then it would have been all right, these mistakes we've made and so forth. Uh, and then, mercy could never have claim on them forever. That's pretty bad. Because, because the, uh, the cup of his wrath, if they wait until, until that is full. Now the fourth verse. Now this is the reaction of the people. This is the proskinesis. They all fall to earth. This is part in Nathan the Babylonian. They do this too. Either ritually overwhelmed, so that you overwhelm the brother. And of course the Muslims still do that five times a day. You fall down right flat on your face. And uh, that's the proskinesis. They fell to earth. And uh, they viewed themselves now not as fiends and flames and uh, burning coals and things like that. They viewed themselves in their own carnal state, less than the dust of the earth. Now he cuts them down. You see, boy, is he going to work on that? And they all cried out with one voice. Now, how could they cry out this long thing with one voice? Well, I told you about the Chazan, the preceptor. He leads in, in throughout the ancient world in, in Roman times and Greek times. He was called the Stasiarch. He would stand up with a, someone would hand him a piece of paper with a slipper. The emperor would tell him or somebody else would tell him what he wanted the people to chant. And they'd say, he'd say, now all together, and he'd read a line and wave the flag, and they'd all chant together. That was these formal chants. And this is what you had in the way it was done in the circus. You'd sit in your cheering section. You had your color, either blue, red, white, blue, or green. And they would fight each other, the faction. But they had cheers leaders and they had cheer sections. But this went way back to the early days of the year festival when uh, the prophet or the leader or the moray would tell them what to believe. And you notice the whole thing is directed uh, in, in Nathan the Babylonian's accounts, directed by the men on the tower. And the old man, the preceptor, comes down. They ask the questions, and uh, the king show, uh, interprets the law to them. And they all answer together. So that's what they're doing here. It isn't as if they all spontaneously recited this whole thing in one voice. It says it was in one voice, but that's the way it was done. It was, it was perfectly, perfectly normal. They all cried aloud with one voice. You see, it says saying in the second verse, Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ. Now, atonement is mentioned quite a number of times in this, in this chapter. The atoning blood of Christ, we may receive forgiveness. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things who shall come down among the children of men. Uh, See, the, uh, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, 
And they were filled with joy. It's a joyful celebration, a great time, you see. They can all hardly stand it, they're so joyful here. Because of their exceeding faith. So this is a marvelously happy event, you see. Uh, the, well, and, uh, and, uh, and who shall come down among the children of men and who spoke these things. Uh, he is ready to bring us back into the great eternal order of things. But how, how is he to do it? You see, this is what we're talking about here. Even if we could make up for our sins here, it is that other life that they're thinking of, you see. And that's, that's now have, they have a glimpse of it. Now they're filled with joy. They're filled with the Spirit. These times come. Because of exceeding faith, we think of the de dedication of the Kirtland Temple. That's the sort of thing happened. And uh, the marvelous manifestations were seen and everybody had revelation. Or the day of Pentecost. Those days, under normal conditions, they would be normal, but the earth is a bad place. So the fifth verse says, Behold, if the knowledge, and then the king says to them, Benjamin replies, notice it's a, a conversation, it's, it's an antiphonal between the king and the people. And between the, the singing is always antiphonal, we can't go into that. Divided into groups, one group answering the other, and so forth, as they discuss on this. If the knowledge of the goodness of God at this time has awakened you, see, they're just full of this knowledge of goodness, uh, has awakened you into to a sense of your nothingness and your worthless and worthless and follow state. Now here, when they're in the type of their glory, he, he starts reminding them of their worthlessness and their, uh, their nothingness and their worthless and fallen state. I don't think I would offend them at all. If you were in the presence of celestial glory, you would certainly feel that way, and you wouldn't feel at all insulted. They don't feel like crawling under rocks, though. They feel pretty good about it. He says, you've come to a knowledge of the goodness of God. You see how good he can be now. This is the grace of God. And then he runs, this is the atonement prepared from the foundation of the earth going back to the pre-existence when they discuss the creation and so forth. And this is, a, this is a biblical expression too. The atonement prepared from the foundation. Christians ignore that where, what was going on then if they, if they prepared a plan at that early time. And that he should come would put his trust in the Lord in keeping his commandments in faith. See, this is the various thing. Prepared from the foundation, you come here, you have faith, you put your trust in him, and then you do something. Keeping his commandments, and it's faith that keeps you on the track. Here we go, go along with these things. And there is none other salvation. This is the only way. Why this peculiar way? Well, as I say, can you think of any other? Uh, after all, our condition is desperate. We've got to trust him, put his trust in the Lord, Got to trust him and you'll be safe. And then you'll do something you'll feel better about it. These are, there are no other, no other conditions. He says there are no other conditions given for this. And here they are, ninth verse, believe in God. Believe that man doth not comprehend all things. Now this justifies you in believing in God. St. Augustine is baffled at the beginning of the confession. Why should I believe in God? If I believe in God, I'm not playing fair. I'm cheating because I believe in him already. And uh, I haven't seen him or anything like that. I have to let him make the first move. And so he goes, argues around and around about that. Fecistinos ad te, et inquietus cor nostum, non equicristia ad te, and so on. You've made us in such a way that our hearts are restless until we've been joined to you somehow. Well, he's right there, but what do we do about it? But the point is this, believe that man doth not comprehend. There are all sorts of things you don't know, you see. So it's quite possible that God can exist. You see. That's among other things, you see. Believe in God, believe that man doesn't comprehend all things that the Lord can comprehend. Of course, that's the greatest stumbling block of science, as Karl Popper says. Then, uh, and again, well then, notice, uh, and, uh, and believe, the next step, the next step, believe that you must repent of your sins. Have to repent here and, uh, and humble yourselves. And now, if you believe all these things, see that you do them. Notice the verse ends that way. First you believe in this, that's so, you'll repent, and then you'll humble yourselves before God, realize that you're nothing. Sincerity, and now, if you believe all these things, see that you do them. It come, all comes down to action here. That's the first pr premise. Become aware of your nothingness and your fallen state. And again, I say unto you, as I've said before, this is this marvelous 11th verse here. The things you almost must keep in mind. No, he says, again, I say unto you, I'm going to give you a reminder. He's hammering it home, you see. If you have a knowledge of the goodness, and taste it, he catches them, see, at this high point, and this, at this euphoria. This is the time to get to work on them without offending them and getting through to them. Their minds are open and they realize that anything is possible now. And he says, if you've known of the goodness and tasted the love, you have received a remission of your sins, which causes you such exceeding great joy in your soul. Notice he keeps repeating joy in this passage, in this chapter too, in your soul. So I would have you remember along with your joy and always retain in remembrance. Always keep this in mind, he says. 
the greatness of God your and your own nothingness. You put the two together, it says, and you have nothing to worry about, because uh, then you won't be uh, bedeviled by your own personal ambitions and disappointments and anything like Nothing will bother you that way if you realize that your own nothingness. And his goodness and long-suffering to you, you unworthy creatures, He's certainly flattering the public here. You unworthy creatures and humble yourselves, even in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily. This is, this is what you're supposed to do now after this. And standing steadfastly in the faith, which you have just received, he says. Behold, I say unto you, now here's a guarantee. It's worth it. It's a darn good investment, he says in the 12th verse. If you do this, you will always rejoice. So if you want to be happy, this is the way you do it. Okay? I certainly believe that. This is the wellspring of humor, too, you notice that. If you realize your own nothingness and the greatness of God, then you realize that's what all humor is, you see. It's recognizing the absurdity of man's position, the pretensions, the fat lady, the pie in the face, and so forth. It deflates the pretensions of vain men. You think you're so important, and so forth, and then you slip on a banana peel, and that's real comedy. That, that is, that's what's funny, because of the human situation, but it's run through all. All humor has that, that ironic touch in it. We pretend to be so great, so important, and so forth, and we're such idiots. You see, it's really very funny, and uh, a person who is nothing, who thinks he's everything, but man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, plays such fantastic tricks before uh, the angels, uh, plays pla before high heaven, plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep, who had their our spleen, would all themselves laugh human. If angels were capable of laughing, we think they are, they'd laugh themselves silly, look at, looking at the antics of man. Man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority. He goes on then. Could great men thunder as Jove thunders? He says, we would have nothing but lightning, because great men think they're so important. Uh, she rubs it in, that's in the measure for measure. Uh, but I said to him, and he saw as he's cutting them down, but you'll always rejoice, and I think that's a fair exchange. I'm perfectly willing to uh, laugh at myself and realize what I am, because it's a fair exchange then. Uh, now, and now he starts, he gets into the economic part, and this is very important. Now, notice this, this is very interesting here. If you have that proper sense of balance and sense of humor, this 12th verse, then you shall grow in knowledge of the glory of him who created him, in the knowledge of that which is just and true. Then you will have a true knowledge, a true value of things. Notice, just and true. You will have the correct values, we'd say today. And that's knowledge, in the knowledge of him, that's a real at one minute. And then the next verse, the reward of that socially, you will not have a mind to injure one another, but live peaceably and render every man according to that which is due. If you realize that you are nothing, you see, and the Lord will take care of everything, He'll solve, everything will be solved if you obey and do what he wants you to do, then you won't have any intention to injure one another. There won't be any rival, and you'll find plenty of this in the Book of Mormon. You know, Envy, jelly, spites, murders, and so forth, all come from the same thing. And uh, the desire for power, and assert your ego and the like. Uh, then you will have no mind, no mind to injure anyone, you live peaceably and render every man according to that which is due. That would make dull fare on prime time, wouldn't it? And he will, and you will not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked. Forty thousand children die of hunger and hunger-related diseases every day. Hmm, something is wrong here. That's something to be afraid of. Not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked. Neither will you suffer that they transgress the laws of God and fight and quarrel one with another, as kids do. And serve the devil, who is the master of sin, who is spoken of by our Father, that other one. But you will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. You will teach them to love one another and to serve one another. The, uh, this is another piece of news. It was on the news last night, on NBC News last night. This year, so far, 160 people have died on the sidewalks of San Francisco. Can you believe that? Died starved on the sidewalks of San Francisco. It's like, ooh, what's going on here? What a society when it comes to that. So he says here, and ye yourselves will succor those who stand in need of your succor. You will administer your substance unto him that standeth in need. He doesn't stand under the, to the worthy needy or under him that deserves it. It's not a case of deserving, as he says here. <coughs> And you will not suffer the beggar put up his petition to you in vain, or turn him out to perish. Perhaps thou shalt say the man who brought this upon him, that brought this misery upon himself. I got mine, he didn't work, he's a lazy bum. That is the excuse we all make, of course. Therefore I will, not, I will stay my hand. I will not give unto him of my food, or impart unto him of my substance. I work for mine, that he may not suffer, for his punishments are just. He is not one of the 
deserving poor. Well, even if this is true, he says, I say unto you, O man, whoever does this, the same hath great cause to repent, and except he repenteth of that which he has done, he shall perish forever, and hath no interest in the kingdom of God, for which in which the law of consecration is mandatory. You have no choice but to keep it. And we've accepted and promised to keep it too. For behold, are we not all beggars? This stings a lot of people. They don't like this at all. They try to give it a, a uh, they, they try to give it a, uh, an allegorical or a symbolic interpretation, spiritually beggars and so forth. I've heard people doing that, you see. But of course, he says your substance. I'm talking about goods and substance and hungry and things, that sort of thing. I'm not talking about what you call spiritual things. Behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend on the same being for, notice not just for our spiritual fare, but substance, food and raiment. He, he says, I'm talking about economics. I'm talking about food supply now, about food and raiment, and gold and silver and all the luxuries you have too. Uh, and now he goes in the next verse, he says, Now God, if God who has created you, on whom you are dependent for your lives and for all that you have and are, he mentioned that before, remember, if you work 24 hours a day just for the Lord, you would still be an unprofitable servant. You can never produce it. You can't produce anything. And that's made so very clear today, more than anything, because the great, the great money makers are not producing anything. They're the takeovers. See, they destroy. They'll destroy companies, take them over, and by manipulation, no longer of computer, but just of, of, uh, of the computer rather than the tape anymore, by manipulation, they become a millionaires, 100 millionaires overnight. You see, you make vast, just, just by, well, you know, you know the deals, the takeovers and the, and the junk bonds and the parachutes and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, and we'll see what King Mosiah does to drive Hogan's point. He goes out and works in the field, and he does it quite seriously. Kings do that, you see. You, you were on the level here of Indian culture, actually. Here. This is the way they keep things, so they have a stable society. Now, oh, yeah, it has a good deal to say in here, in this geographic, about the society that's stable, and the expansive society that has to go out and wreck anything, and it's not, if it's not growing at least 4% a year. But you can't go on doing that forever. There's only a limited base on which we can go and so forth. And it was also in the paper this week. I'm sure this is the only place in the world where you have a large and powerful society made, made of mining, lumber, cattle interests, and so forth that call themselves the Anti-Wilderness League. They have the Anti-Wilderness League. Of course, they have nothing against the wilderness, but they just want to take all the stuff on it. But since this is the state that produces kids faster than any other, you'd think we'd be more concerned with a rather distant future. Why destroy the, the resource base for the generations to come? And boy, they're out for taking everything they can right now to make a quick profit. Well, that's the philosophy of the time. I don't need to tell you people that I want it all and I want it now. Uh, and then, if God, who is dependent, or you are dependent for your lives, for all that you have and are, doth grant you whatsoever you ask, is right in faith, believing you shall receive. Now, that is a, an unconditional offer. Well, it's a conditional offer. Of course it is. Anything you ask for, if it's right, and you ask in faith, <coughs> believe you shall receive, then you'll get it, see? Oh, then how you ought to impart of your substance to one another, and not at some future time when we find it easier and more convenient to observe these rules, see? We hear that at all, all the time. And if you judge a man who put us out of his petition, you judge him. You say he's not worthy, you see. Have you worked? Have you, uh, do you deserve this? He puts up his petition, you see, uh, that he perish not. But he's desperate, see? He has, he has no choice here. Brigham Young, you read his account of his first mission in England, it was horrifying, it was in the 50s. There was a bad year in the cities, of, in the cities like Manchester, Leeds, and people literally were dropping dead in the streets, everywhere. And there, England was never richer than at that time. The rich were just, were just rolling in the fatness of the land, and these people were actually dropping dead in Brigham. And you see how that got through to Brigham Young, and why he became such an ardent champion for the, the order and so forth. And so, if you judge a man and put it, and that he perish not, see, this isn't, uh, but you don't judge him, you don't hesitate and say, well, I don't know whether I should or not, and condemn him, that's what you do. You say he hasn't worked as hard as you have, and maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. Of course, we have the interesting philosophy, you see, that uh, anything, uh, you're either doing, you're either making money or you're doing nothing, see? Uh, yeah, that's the choice you have. You can either work for, for profit, you can either prepare to make money or make money, and if you're not doing that, you're doing nothing. You can be considered idle in that case. That's why we've reinterpreted the idler shall not eat the bread of labor. And of course, for all these thousands of years, it has simply meant that the idle rich shall not eat the bread of the laboring poor, which has been the rule down through the ages. We've turned it right around today. I worked for mine, and so you won't eat my bread. Well, we won't go into that. Stick to Mosiah. Don't look at me. 
I didn't say it. Uh, now he says, no, he says here, condemn him how much more will be your condemnation for withholding your substance, which doth not belong to you, but to God. And what he asks you to do with it is this, he says, belongs to him. And yet you put up no petition, nor repent for the thing which you have done in doing that thing. I say unto you, woe be unto this man, for his substance shall perish with him. And of course, you, you can't take it with you as far as that goes. Now I say these things unto those who are rich as pertaining to the things of this world. He frankly says this is an economic discourse I'm giving you here. And again to the poor, who have not, and yet have sufficient, can keep life and body and soul together. I mean, all you who deny the beggar because you have not, I would that you say in your hearts, I give not because I have not. And yet it's a fact, of course, if, you're, if a person is going around, uh, Salt Lake is a great place, and the uh, crossroads of the West and so forth for panhandlers and for tramps going through and for the getting turned down. They'll tell you it's the hardest town in the country as far as that goes. But the, uh, uh, Every tramp knows that if you want a handout, you don't go to Rich House, for heaven's sake. That's the last thing you do. You get thrown downstairs. You're thrown out the back porch. You go to people who are poor, and they'll give you something. That's the best chance you have. And uh, it's the same way of contributions and so forth. But these people, if you say in your hearts, I have not because I've given up. It's just, but it's, it has to be sincere, 25. Now, if you say this in your hearts, you don't. Of course, if you're rich, you can't possibly say it in your hearts. You must be very poor indeed. But I mean, even the poorest is going to share. And you, you're going to see that's the way. Uh, during the bad times of the, of the tw 20s, and when I was a little kid, playing in the backyard every day, always in the back, in the, uh, in the afternoon, uh, there were always, there was always a, gr a grimy old tramp, or maybe two, and they weren't tramps, they were like the street people today, with mother's standard handout, uh, the bacon and eggs, the bread and the milk and all this stuff, and you could all, there was a mark on the front door, and every, every tramp knew it was there, and they knew there was a handout, they were good for a handout, and mother never turned them down, we never should, because she learned from her father when they lived on the plains up in Alberta, they went out to Raymond, Alberta, and, and ranched out there, and uh, whether it was Indian, whether it was anyone else, their father just hammered it into never, 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 like Brigham Young, turn anybody away. Because many have been visited by angels unawares. They may be testing you as far as that goes, you see. So that has always been the policy, never turn anybody away. And it makes it very cruel when it comes to giving people rides on the highway, you see, because see what an awful position we've got ourselves in. Where for your own safety you dare not, it's even against the law sometime, and yet you can't afford to pass somebody out in the road. And, uh, so I always pick them up. I haven't been bumped in the head yet, but uh, you have to take the risk. It's worth taking the risk, I mean. Mm. And sometimes it can be a pretty bad risk. Some of those characters are pretty tough, you know. Uh, and, uh, but, but you have to do it, you see. Usually if you start preaching to them, they'll, uh, they'll ask to get out. <laughs> 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 Stop here, let me out. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, but we don't go into that. And now, if you say this in your hearts, and your condemnation is just, for you covet that. Well, if you say this in your heart, you remain guiltless. Otherwise, you're condemned, for you covet that which is you have not received. It's not yours. And then now, even more important is that God gives you a remission of your sins from day to day. That is great if that happens, you see. But of course, they stay with you as far as that goes. Nevertheless, that means a remission of your sins means another chance. We give you another chance. He knows you're going to sin some more too, but he'll still give you another chance because as long as you're in the flesh. Remember that marvelous verse that Nephi says, God has lengthened the days of man on earth. He may have a better chance to repent, you see. We live far longer than we need to, but it gives us a marvelous chance to repent. He says, that's the purpose of lengthening it beyond age of procreation and so forth. Uh, so, then, uh, and then here is the rule. This is a very important rule. Incidentally, Louis Blanc in the Commune in Paris uh, in 1871, this was the slogan of it, from each according to his needs, uh, to e from each according to his means, to each according to his needs. The, uh, that is the same slogan as we have here. But the next verse tells us where it went wrong, where, where that can go wrong. But first, this one here. You should impart of your substance to the poor every man, this 26th verse, according to that which he has. If you, if you have an awful lot of reserve laid away, a, a couple of hundred million in the bank or something like that, you haven't given according to that which you have, I'm sure. If you have anything left at all, in fact, such as feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, visiting the sick, administering to their relief, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants. If they want what they, what they want, their wants need to be supplied, and that's all there is to it, you see. But 
This is what goes wrong. This is where we break down in the next verse. That's a fine. You say, oh, that's a fine theory. I won't have to do that because, no, it says you have to administer it in the proper way. And I say that's where the breakdown has been because the human beings, they, they haven't had these principles of the gospel or haven't seen, uh, had this vision of the eternities to, uh, to inspire them and keep them on the track as the early saints had and says, see that all these things are done in wisdom and in order. See, that's the trouble. It leads to disorder and squabbling. I inevitably, that happens when you try to, in any kind of economic order, and it's pretty bad, you see. And that man should run faster than he had strength. That is the usual weakness, you see. Getting ahead of the program, trying to do it all overnight, uh, uh, which we, you call it revolution, see, a sudden quick change, trying to run faster than you have strength. You have to build up to these things, but you have to keep at it. You have to use wisdom and order. And again, it's expedient that you should be diligent, keep at it, that you might win the prize. Therefore, all things must be done in order. It has to be done, but you have to keep the pressure on and do it, as far as that goes. Well, we use that as, as an excuse for not doing it at all. We say, well, every time we try to, to put this thing over, we spent two, two weeks trying to, to install the law of consecration. <laughs> Last week it didn't work at all. It broke down, so we won't try it at all. Well, that's not the way things are done in order and what Brigham Young was trying to do so hard. Uh, and, jo and John Taylor and uh, Lorenzo Snow and Wilfred Rudolph, they were all ardent champions. They tried to do it. Saints wouldn't do it. And that was that. What kind of saints? Now, and th but notice here, you do have private property. There is such a thing, and it's very important. But let's remember the importance of this word, uh, uh, property and private. Uh, proprium, of course. And privatus. They both mean set aside uh, to the individual here. The uh, Proprium is, uh, the basic meaning is to separate. The basic meaning is the word is to separate. Uh, proprium, um, uh, well, the root is parara, is parara, is to set apart. This means a thing which is proprium. It means set apart. This means that belongs to you only and is unique to you. It's privatis. It can't be related to anybody else in the human race, state or anybody else. And proprium means mine. It's proper. It's mine proper and nobody else. It means absolute con and complete possession, and it's a thing that you need for yourself. It's necessary. That is to say, your clothes, your shoes, your books, could be, you can share them around, you lose them all, that's all right, uh, and the things you must have for your house, the things you want to use, the shelter, the food, the shelter, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. These are property to you, and they shouldn't be separated from any man. Everybody has to have his glasses if he needs them, or, or his toupee, or whatever it is. And, uh, but it, it's the sort of thing that can't, by nature, can't be shared by anyone else. It won't fit anybody else. His teeth or something like that, see? Well, that's very private as far as that goes. That's what's really meant by private, see? And it's, it's very clear in the Jewish law. That makes it very clear. And then remember, he's, he's going by the law of Moses, where every seven years you have to, all debts are canceled, every seven, all debts are canceled, no longer, any, and every servant must be freed. Anyone who's in bond, every contract is dissolved. You go right back to where you were in the beginning, because that's, that goes back, you see, to the, the time when they were in the wilderness and the Lord fed them with manna and so forth, and they were all equal. And you couldn't profit on the man because it says if you kept it for 24 hours, against the day when uh, there would be a shortage, it, was, uh, it would uh, spoil and start to stink. It said it, it would stink, you couldn't keep it. Many people wanted, you see, to, to profit by it. The future's in manna, but it never worked. <laughs> so here we go. The, uh, and so it says here, if you borrow something from a, from a neighbor, uh, that is tools and so forth, Practically every year we have to replenish all our tools in the garage because people borrow them and never return them. Ladders, everything else, ladders, spades, rakes, and everything else. They never return them. But if you buy, but that's a personal thing. See, a, a personal tool you have, uh, well, your books, your, your notebooks, and your writing utensils, your house, and your children, things like that. That's privatis and pro. But you can't have private. Something like we used to live, we used to go down and swim at, at Malibu when I was a little kid. And of course it was a, a beach and we'd, we'd just stay all night there. But you shouldn't. You'd get arrested if they caught you there. Because the whole area belonged to an old woman who lived in Philadelphia, a crotchety old creature, and uh, she'd never seen it. But you couldn't go there because her name was, somebody's name was on a piece of paper somewhere. We call that property. That isn't private. That isn't property at all. Or as Brigham Young puts it, 
an old lady's cow, an old, an old widow's cow, is what she needs to live Oh, bossy. She depends on that for a living. He says, I've known many a Latter-day Saint who has bought a, a widow's cow from her for five dollars and then gone down on his knees and thanked the Lord for his great blessing. He said that on more than one occasion. Many a Latter-day Saint has, has taken the uh, 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 a widow's only cow has taken a widow's only cow for five dollars because she had to have the money and then gone down on his knees and thanked the Lord <laughs> for his blessings. Well, that's what he's talking about here. You return what you take. People have a right to what, some things that are private and that's so. Needless to say, the people that are threatened most in their privacy are those that have the least or such thing. They don't have the uh, they don't have the Doberman pinchers and the electrified fences and the, and the lighting, the floodlights, uh, and the uh, electronic gates, uh, and the telephones and the walkie-talkies patrolling the place. This fetish for, uh, I knew a, a, a very rich Latter-day Saint in Southern California, a top man who was so important he had to be accompanied by bodyguards all the time and you couldn't get anywhere near his house. It was in the district. You had to to go through a gate, identify yourself with a card and everything else. Now that's, th that's the way to live, isn't it? He's, he's a prisoner practically as far as that goes. Yeah. Well, yes, he lived, has to live in a compound. He can only go out under certain conditions. It's like asking, have to ask for permission before he can go out. He's checked coming in and going out. That's, that's the way to live, all right. Uh, all things, well then he says, among you who borrow from his neighbor, according to it he doth agree, or else he shall commit sin. Notice he's made an agreement with it. According as if you'd agree to be give it back, that's all right. If he lets you keep it, that's fine too. But you must keep your agreements among yourselves in your personal affairs and the things that really belong to you, or else he shall commit sin, and perhaps thou shalt cause thy neighbor to commit sin the same way. This, this happens the same way. Privatum separara. And finally, I cannot tell, now he says, I could make a long list of the ways you can sin, all the ways you should sin, but he says, uh, like the probabilists, of the 16th century. Molinus was the famous Spanish probabilist, a Jesuit, who compiled that great list of sins and how, how much one sin weighs against another, the, a decimal point, so on. How many sins can you list? Well, he says you can list sins further. Oh, the, this is a good point, incidentally, because the, I'm still looking for the author of that quotation. There, uh, I think it was Watkins, some slide. It's, it's, it's a maxim, everybody knows it. Uh, there are a thousand ways uh, in which a thing can go wrong, but only one way in which a thing can go right, he says. When, when you're calculating, you see, in the chances in, in the physics, in, in, the, uh, in quantum physics and so forth, there are, th there are thousands of ways in which things can go wrong, you see, but only one way in which things can go wrong. That's his argument. So that somebody must be in charge, because if you leave it up to chance, which they say is what does it, you see, uh, Darwinism and so forth, it all happens by chance. Everything could go wrong and stay wrong forever, but only one way things can go right. Who takes care of that? Well, anyway, he says, I can't number them. But this much I can tell you. See, now this is what he's been getting at. See, this is his big chance to get through to them. He says his farewell address and so forth. But this I can tell you that if you do not watch yourselves, notice, and your thoughts, and your words, and your deeds. These are the three things, remember. These are the three things you produce. You produce thoughts, you produce words, and you produce deeds. Observe the commandments and continue in the faith which you've heard this day, you see, concerning the Lord. Even unto the end of your lives, you must perish. So we, we are, we're at risk here. It's very serious. This test is very important. Now the king says, do you, I do accept that. See, they're going to make a covenant now. It's very important. They're going to make the covenant. It's the year time and the time they make covenants. He desires to know if they believe. And they all cried out again. You see, here's the, the Hazan, the preceptor. They all cried out with one voice saying, notice it's in verse here. We believe all thy words, pause, which thou hast spoken unto us, pause, and also we know of their surety and truth, pause, because of the spirit of the Lord, pause, uh, of the Lord omnipotent, pause, which has wrought a mighty change in our hearts, pause, and we have no more disposition to do evil, pause, but to do good continually. And we ourselves also, through the infinite of God, the manifestation, have great views of things which are to come. This is, he started out by saying, Open your ears, remember, and pay attention to have views of the mysteries of God. And this is what he's been talking about. He says we have great views. They see marvelous prospects there. And we are willing to enter into a covenant, they say, and the they're going to do it. Now, the new year, remember, at the new year, all contracts are, all contracts are made. Whether well, it's in England, for example, the king, you hold the festival, which is a year festival, has to take place uh, at the solstice, uh, Christmas time. That time, all contracts are made only at Christmas. They can't be made at any other time. I mean, contract with a servant. 
if the servant, you can't catch hold of him for a year and a day, then he's free because the contract only lasts for a year. It has to be renewed every year uh, when you come to the thing, to the great uh, assembly of the king and uh, to the year right by various names. But that's the time contracts are made. And the rule is, of course, if, uh, if uh, after a year and a day it becomes invalid and has to be renewed at the end of the year. That's what they do. We covenant with our God and property to be obedient in all these things. And then he says, and now he says in the seventh verse, because of the covenant you've made, Yishai, he's going to give them a new name. And of course, you always get that. A new, year, a new name, a new identity, a new year, a new life, a new beginning. It's a refreshing of things. That's what we're talking about. You shall be called the children of Christ, his sons, his daughters, for behold. This day he has spiritually begotten you. Well, what is Christmas? It's the Natalia. It's the Genethlia. It's the birthday, see? Uh, that's what it's called, uh, you know, in French, Spanish, German, everything else. It's the, it's the great birthday of the Natalia. It's the birthday of whom? Of the human race, of the king. In Egypt, everybody dated his own birthday from the year of the king. He dated his own life from the, the year, from the king's birthday. That's when you date your own life. You say, I'm, I'm 20 years old as of the king's last coronation. You see? That's the way they would do it. So the king's birthday is everybody's birthday. That's the renewal of the year. And it's because you're born, he's been, notice this day, has he spiritually begotten you? For your hearts are changed, and you were born of him, and have become his sons and daughters. So we get, I say, well, what do they call it in, uh, notice he says, and this day, which is the new year, the Hebrew, it's the Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, which is almost a literal translation of the Egyptian uh, Sebi, Tep Sebi. The head, the head of the, the beginning. Tepsepi is the time of the pre-existence, which is renewed. But the Tepsepi means the beginning, the re-inauguration of the whole thing, the Tepsepi. And uh, here, it is the same thing as I say, as what the, the Jews call it. It's the Rosh Hashanah. That's the, the beginning of the year, the beginning of the creation, the beginning of everything. So they're renewing their whole life. They've been begotten. And you are born of him and have become his sons and daughters. And moreover, you are made three. It's the universal birthday. And they celebrate it. When this comes out, as soon as this is announced, everybody yells, Yo Saturnalia. The Yo Saturnalia. That means all servants are free now. Everybody is equal. In Israel, it was literally so. It was the Hallelujah. It was the Jubilee year. They celebrate the Jubilee when no servant's a servant anymore. No one is subject to anybody anymore. Nobody's in debt to anybody anymore. That's the way it was in the original. That's the way the Lord wants it to be. So they're rehearsing this, just as at Christmas. We pretend to live in a jolly time that's that shows that we are capable of living under such conditions, but we can't last more than that. And you know what we've done to Christmas commercial-wise. So take upon your name of Christ and all you that have entered into the covenant. And then he does the next thing. Well, I see the time is up now. Uh, he's invited to the t into the tent and so forth. And then he talks about the right hand and the left hand of God. That's an important part of the celebration. And then he has a... Uh, and then he says, would you remember that the name is always written in your hearts? And then he takes the census. The next chapter, he takes the census. He takes down, remember, at the first he said there was a numerous, they didn't number them. But now they've entered a covenant. They've committed themselves by name. So he has the names taken of everybody who was there. Their names are all taken down, and they're enlisted as it was in Rome, the list of the Enchisi, the incised list. You see that you weren't, weren't a member of the, kin, the kingdom unless you were on the list. So you had to be registered in the books, the books that were open from the foundation of the world. Remember, when the world was founded, the books were open. They always preached. The Book of Life was one of those books. Here there are many of the books. The Book of Life, as the formula goes in the New Testament, which was open at the foundation of the world, containing the names of all those who had come down to this earth in, this, in the various dispensations. That's what the Book of Life was, as understood by the Jews and the Christians in the early days. So all this falls into the pattern of, the, uh, of reality, of the real social organization, and the fact that it bears this, this amazing stamp of authenticity, that everything takes place here exactly according to the pattern of the, of the ancient year assembly and the like.